Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for being here this afternoon. We have what I hope will be uh, an engaging program for you where we will provide uh, general information about AIF and the different categories and also um, have an opportunity for questions with um, some of us in the teaching commons, Kartiga from the AVP Teaching and Learning, Michelle Sangara, uh, the Director of Academic Innovation, who's also involved in AIF, and three uh, professors who have um, an AIF, AIF grant of different kinds and are here to um, tell us a little bit about their project and, and also able to answer some of the questions that we will get in the second half of today's session. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me start uh, with a land acknowledgement. Um, and I'll take a couple, three minutes to, to do that if you don't mind. <clears throat> So as an educator and as a parent, um, I've been reflecting on, on what the land acknowledgement means for me, uh, realizing that we all have important responsibilities in, in acknowledging the land on which um, we are privileged to live on. So uh, for me, this starts with sharing some facts about me and the land that I call home. I am not indigenous, but of settler colonial ancestry. My heritage is French Canadian uh, and extends to France um, primarily. Like many other settlers, I have benefited greatly from living across Turtle Island, including in the Innu Nation, the Wolastokiwik, Mi'kmaq, and Passamak Dodi Nations, and the lands of the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Sioux, and Metis peoples. The city of Vaughan, from where I join you today, is situated in the territory and Treaty 13 lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This controversial treaty, also known as the Toronto Purchase, was signed in 1805. And if you don't mind, I'd like to give a very brief, very brief history of that treaty. So earlier, the territory of the growing town of York, uh, or present-day Toronto, was acquired in the Johnson and Butler Purchase of 1787-88. It was, however, poorly defined and lacked uh, adequate documentation. The Mississauga agreed that Johnson had purchased the land with the understanding that the mouth of the Etobicoke River was reserved for them uh, for their use as a fishery. However, the size of this new purchase was several times larger than remembered. Treaty 13 was meant to resolve this issue, but provided no further clarification. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, the land size under this new agreement over a thousand kilometers square was several times larger than the 26 kilometers square that Johnson himself had remembered. Later in 1916, a report confirmed that not all of the land was fully ceded. And the issue was finally settled in 2010 uh, which resulted in a, a one, $145 million settlement to the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, from which each of the 1,842 adult Ben members received a small payment, while the rest of the funds were put in trust to be used for affordable housing and clean water. So I hope this lends some understanding of the lands on which we are situated today, and also how our colonial history continues to harm Indigenous peoples to this day. Um, I'm not all that familiar with that history, as you can tell. Uh, I read most of my notes, um, and in doing this, I consulted a few sources, um, including the Canadian Encyclopedia, uh, which is a, a colonial source, the City of Vaughan's website, which is also a colonial uh, source, and Trent University's webpage on how to do a meaningful land acknowledgement. So I do realize that I have a limited understanding of our indigenous settler relations, but I, I commit to learning more about our colonial history and, and also invite knowledge keepers to correct my misinterpretations and inaccuracies. So with that, um, I would encourage you to include um, the land acknowledgement from which you are situated in the chat and we will uh, move along. So we are here to discuss uh, the Academic Innovation Fund. 
And uh, in order to, to do that part, I will turn this over to Karthika Gorishrenker, who's the um, Director of Strategic Initiatives in the AVP Teaching and Learning. Karthika. Thanks, John Viev. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, that was an amazing landmark acknowledgement. Thank you. I'm also learning. Um, really great and happy to see the number of participants today interested in AIF. So we're excited and we're excited to have, as John Viev mentioned, our, our team within Teaching and Learning and Teaching Commons here, as well as uh, faculty members, uh, faculty colleagues to share their experience um, uh, with AIF as well. So what is the academic innovation? So it was established in 2010. So we just recently celebrated a decade uh, of academic innovation funding. Uh, and it's really, as, as, as faculty colleagues, we know that there's a lot of uh, research funding opportunities, but not in the teaching and learning realm. So the Academic Innovation Fund was established in consultation with the community um, to really provide seed uh, funding opportunities for uh, faculties to innovate uh, new uh, curriculum and pedagogical innovations in alignment with our university academic plan. So the uh, main pillars uh, or priority areas in teaching and learning that we tend to focus is on technology enhanced learning, also referenced here as e-learning, uh, experiential education and the spectrum um, within EE there, uh, student success and retention strategies, um, as well as internationalization within the curriculum. And since the new um, UAP, um, we've uh, started to embed a new focus on sustainable development goals within um, within the AIF. And so there's a particular section uh, within each of the applications to get um, the proponents to think about how the applications, whether it be category one, two, or three, and we'll go into each of these categories momentarily um, to talk about how SDG can be aligned. So as I mentioned, we are just celebrating uh, a decade. Um, so uh, AIF quickly at a glance, it's 1.5 million awarded annually. Um, so last year, 23 uh, projects were funded. Uh, so based on the number, you can see it is a competitive grant. Uh, it is an internal uh, grant open to your community members. And over the past decade, we funded over 17 million to 348 unique individual projects. Many have sustained and have become large scale. So the first year you start programs, an example, um, becoming YU and there's a uh, global network learning initiatives. And then you'll hear about one of the, so some of the projects uh, here as well. Um, next slide, Jean-Pierre. Thank you. So um, as I alluded to briefly earlier, we have three categories of funding and um, each of us will go into depth about what each of the categories of funding will be and then provide, and our faculty colleagues are here to talk about an example of a project that they were funded under these categories. So the major grant is um, the largest bu uh, bucket is category one. It really supports large scale projects um, that are department or school focused. It could be interfaculty. And I'll go into a little bit uh, details uh, momentarily. We have category two grants that support course development, course redesign within existing or new courses uh, within technology enhanced learning, experiential education, et cetera. Um, and we also have Category three um, grants that are focused on scholarships of uh, teaching and learning. jean next slide please, thank you. So what does category one grant uh, support? So it starts off with a $50,000. Each project uh, can apply to three consecutive years of funding. Um, and if it's, if it's a pan faculty or a pan university, initiative that advances one of the priority areas uh, within teaching and learning, then um, you can apply to 100,000 uh, 
per, uh, per year of funding. So that, that gives 300,000 in total uh, over the next three years and it's large scale grants um, that advance technology enhanced learning, student experience, experiential education, um, and internationalization of the curriculum. So examples of projects could be uh, embedding a first year transition program or any transition programs within your schools or department, building, building technology enhanced learning infrastructure, um, creating brand new degree programs or brand new uh, internship or co-op programs within, uh, within the programs. Uh, those are some of the large scale initiatives as well. So that's just a bit uh, of an overview of category one. Um, and I'll, I'll wait for the end to ask any questions. And typically what people have done uh, within the budget is to hire um, project support students uh, to help with the bulk of the administration of the project work within category one. So that's how the funding is, is used uh, within that large scale projects. So I think that's it in terms of category one. Um, just kept it very brief. Uh, what I'll do is now I'll we'll invite uh, one of our colleagues who's here to talk about her category project one. Um, I think it's Bridget Cotry. So Javia or Bridget, I'll yes. hand it over to Bridget. you. Thank you, Kartika. Uh, thank you, Kartika and Jean-Viev, um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, would you like me to talk about the kind of project I've worked on most recently? Is there anything specific you'd like me to speak to or just sort of generally frame the project and... Um, yeah, maybe if you can just give a brief introduction to your project sure. and then talk about how AIF has helped advance that initiative within your okay. uh, unit and your faculty. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. So um, <clears throat> just by uh, way of introduction, my name is Bridget Cawthry. Um, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Dance in um, AMPD. Um, my most recent... Um, AIF grant and project uh, came about as a result of an invitation from the then uh, former associate dean academic for AMPD and um, uh, Judith Schwartz. Um, my understanding is that prior to being invited to uh, collaborate with uh, Judith on the project, there had been an express need within AMPD to establish a generic skills and critical literacies course for all um, open to all AMPD um, undergraduate students. Um, and that this would be a pan faculty course, uh, which would help to support the transition from high school to university learning um, and to speak to the specific areas of uh skills and knowledges that students engaged in one of our uh, seven programs would need to um, have in their toolbox in order to succeed so um, the project responded to uh, student satisfaction but also ultimately to retention um, throughout their degree programs um, students were yes thank you natasha school of arts media performance and design thank you um, so it also spoke to retention rates is that the understanding from our um, student advising um, <clears throat> office within uh, AMPD was that there was some, um, that students were having difficulty uh, with certain skill areas and that may not acquire those skill areas until their third or fourth year, and then look back on the first two years of their degree programs and think, oh, I wish I had known X. And maybe that was um, writing skills, maybe that was presentation skills, perhaps that was um, uh, research skills. It, it, it covered quite a large area. Um, so I was invited to collaborate with Judith Schwartz on the design 
of a pen faculty course for um, students who were engaged in one of the uh, seven programs in our faculty. Um, and so the, we'd identified the need had already been identified. Um, and then this was this project was to respond to that need um, or is respond to the gap in um, in our collective programs. Um, so I embarked on a it took about it's, it was a, a two year project. Um, and the first year was spent um, completing a competency mapping exercise. Uh, and with the support and collaboration of um, chairs and undergraduate program assistants in each of our departments, I um, collected all of the required courses, required, yeah, course outlines, syllabi for all of the required courses uh, for undergraduate students in first and second year. And uh, with the support of a research assistant, we went through that and mapped out all of the different competencies that students were required to either have or acquire over the course of um, the term and um, where there was overlap. So um, I really, many classes in, um, in my faculty use uh, journals either to describe uh, their artistic process or to reflect on engagement and embodiment um, and the learning of a craft in one way or another. Um, then also something that I found that many courses had in common was the idea of a critique or a review of a uh, presentation, a gallery presentation, a stage presentation. So there was lots of uh, very similar kinds of activities and the learning objectives um, could be quite clearly articulated in the course outline, but were more specific if you actually got to the learning objectives for individual assignments. So in analyzing those and finding out where there were synergies and overlaps, um, it actually became quite easy to envision a course that would speak to all of those different competencies, um, regardless of the discipline. Um, and uh, so the second part of uh, that project was to build a course um, that was flexible enough that it would seem relevant to students regardless of their program and their major, but also comprehensive enough that it could actually um, speak to students' needs, whether they were taking a course in their own program or a course in another program within our faculty or even outside of that um, yeah, so the course was launched um, in January of 2020, 2021, um, and it's called uh, Pan F1900 Skills for Success in the Arts, which is quite an ambitious title, um, uh, but um, alongside the initial rollout, um, we were tracking and measuring um, students' engagement levels, students' responses, um, and we did a number of different surveys and measurement tools um, supported by an external arm's length uh, pedagogical researcher. And uh, so that we could really understand the impact that this course was having. Um, and we delivered two reports to our dean in AMPD suggesting that this course had met the results were that the course had met its uh, had filled a, the perceived gap uh, and that students were seeing improvement in the grades that they received in courses that they were taking concurrently um, with pan f 1900 but also courses that they took subsequently um, so yeah that's the that was my aif project Thank you, Bridget, for sharing that. I think we're going to wait for the end for questions. So with this, I'll hand it over to Natasha. Thank you, Karthika. Hello, everyone. My name is Natasha May. I'm an educational developer in the Teaching Commons. And I'll begin briefly by talking about Category 2 broadly. Then I'll talk specifically about the 2A, because you can see there are two um, 
categories of category two. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. We'll hear from um, one of the AIF recipients, um, Professor Jessica Vorstermans. She has kindly uh, recorded a video and then will join us at 3.30. So you, she will still be here and available for questions. Um, so I'll begin just by talking about category two. So um, in comparison to category one, category two focuses more at the course level. So in sort of course redesign and redesign proposals, um, there are different prior priority areas. So similar to what Carthigo was talking about for category one, there may be elements of incorporating technology enhanced learning or e-learning into your course or experiential education, which is what um, EE stands for on the slide there. Um, so you might incorporate different experiential education components and Jessica will talk specifically about that. Um, and the grant amount for, for category two in both a and B categories is $5,000 per course. Um, and then maybe I'll just talk specifically about the 2A, so curricular grants. Um, so this is, again, if for any course redesign or um, um, proposal of, of incorporating either e-learning, experiential education, or internationalization. Um, and you'll also hear a little bit from Jessica about that, uh, about making some changes or adding some components. And I know there were some questions um, from the registration form that we got. Um, and so there is additional support that we can provide at the Teaching Commons, both in your proposal, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, at the end, but also um, as you are engaging. Um, so when you get the grant, um, then as you engage, you will have support from the teaching commons, either it, with one or both of <laughs> support for e-learning or experiential education, or maybe both depending upon your project. So yeah, so now um, let's hear from Jessica. So maybe um, I should do, yes, I will share my screen with the sound. All right, let's play and make sure that uh, that you can hear us well. Hi, my name is Jessica Borstermans. I'm an assistant professor over in critical disability studies in the faculty of health. Um, and I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes telling you a bit about um, a recent AIF um, that I was granted for my course. It's a big undergrad first year course called Health on the Front Lines. Um, and one of the things that I do in my course is bring lots of um, guest speakers from the community who are doing health equity work in the community. Um, and I really wanted to um, apply for this AIF in order to have meaningful funding to do this work really well with community members. So community members are often asked to come in um, and speak and teach our students and talk to our students and mentor our students. Um, and it's often very impactful for students. I hear it all the time, um, just around them thinking about what kinds of ways that they're going to fit into our world when they leave York in terms of and just kind of the access to information that they um, bring, the perspective that they bring. I use a framework of intersectionality in the course. I mean, so really centering lived experience is important. Um, and asking folks to um, come in for, you know, little compensation um, is difficult because they're engaged in front. Apologies, it seems the, the video is still loading. Um, and speak and teach our students and talk to our students and mentor our students. Um, and it's often very impactful for students. I hear it all the time, um, just around them thinking about what kinds of ways that they're going to fit into our world when they leave York in terms of um, just kind of the access to information that they um, bring, the perspective that they bring. I use a framework of intersectionality in the course. I mean, so really centering lived experience is important. Um, and asking folks to um, come in for, you know, 
little compensation um, is difficult because they're engaged in frontline work. And so the AIF was really an opportunity for me to do something innovative. So um, I worked with a student group on campus who does uh, documentaries and filming um, and actually went into the community where folks were. So went to a community farm, um, went to, um, I can't even think now, <laughs> other places and interviewed community members um, and the work they're doing. And then, um, so the funding went towards compensating them for that um, labor and knowledge, compensating the um, documentary student team to do that. Um, and, you know, a couple other expenses along the way. And so it was really an opportunity for me to be able to do something innovative in my course and compensate um, community members well for that. And now I'm able to use these videos um, in my course. Um, and then I bring in um, the guest speakers on Zoom to kind of do some networking and mentoring with students. So it's a less of a commitment, but the students still have access to that really high quality um, guest kind of lecture experience. Um, and yeah, I've, I'll be on later on to tell you to do some Q&A, but um, it was a very easy process. It's not very time consuming to, to fill out the application. Um, you can pull different pieces already from your syllabus and things like that. So um, overall, um, it was a really, um, it really paid off <laughs> for um, being able to um, compensate um, something really innovative in my teaching. So thank you to Jessica, and she will join us very soon, actually. Um, and so I will turn it over to Michelle now to talk about Category 2B. Okay, um, Michelle, are you there? I'm going to... Oh, this yeah, this I started talking, again. obviously, you know, while muted, classic, classic Zoom. Um, yeah, go ahead and start the slides again, Javier. Thanks so much. So just like we just heard from that AIF recipient, the compensation is a key motivator and incentive when it comes to getting people, um, and especially the burnout world that we live in today, you know, getting people to um, opt in to try new things and to experiment. Uh, so category 2B, you can go ahead to the next slide, Julia. There we go. Oh, yes, yeah, I have animations in my slide. You're just going to load them all. Just load them all at one time. Go for it. Perfect. So category 2B is a way to motivate instructors to work in community. So it's a bit of a new format this year. I see Pam Sargent's on the call. She's working in AAF 2 b at the moment uh, from our last year's call, but we've changed it slightly where what we want to really be doing is promoting uh, interaction as practitioners. So innovation, learning like we're doing right now, learning about what people did in, in these different grants, right? It's a key element of getting new ideas, some traction. So it's a community of practice model. And I emphasize this because there is an expectation of attendance and engagement with this uh, category. Um, so I wanna really be clear. And what we're working on innovating, so when it comes to the actual academic innovation prototypes that you're working on, all your, every participant is gonna be probably, I mean, Kartiga will tell me if I'm overshooting here, but I think we're gonna be able to grant up to eight to 12 participants in the group. And, um, that's the community, eight to 12 folks. And, but you're all working on your own courses. You're all working on your own innovations in your individual domains, but we wanna look at some of these broad categories. So instructional concepts, right? How are we organizing what we're teaching? How are we trying to be experiential in how we're teaching? How are we looking at trying some new ways of assessing and measuring skills maybe in our courses alongside knowledge acquisition? So. We want to look at those instructional concepts. We want to look at intentional technology. This group is also going to be um, getting kind of prime access to these newly kitted out uh, equipment rooms in the Dondele building. Patrick Thibado is part of your support team. He's the uh, uh, director of IT. So we, you're going to have support with trying out new technologies. Um, and then the prototyping process it, you know, we're going to look at from design through to delivery. So there's purposeful design, supported development. You're going to have access to large group, whole group meetings where we're all together. If you feel more comfortable attending online, we're going to make that possible. And then also individual support, targeted individual support. So 
Yeah, there's going to be cohesion in terms of this process we're engaging in together, but there's going to be customization. Your course, what you want to see happen is going to be what happens. Next slide, please, Geneviève. Go ahead and yeah, just do all the animations. Awesome. So just to kind of flush out what expectation, like what you can expect in terms of time. Um, in May, we're going to do some kickoff. We're going to get together as a group. We're going to really forge some, you know, some trust and 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 start communicating with each other and learning what that looks like. We're going to do some instructional goal setting. You know, for my course, I think this is my instructional goal. This is my technological goal. Then we're going to move into the summer where the bold course through the TC is available for you. Um, we're going to get into the thicket of design and development and do a lot of experience sharing in terms of how that process is going as a whole group. A lot of guess and test using of these technologies as well. Like there's VR that you can test out and Patrick will be there to support us. TC is the teaching comments. Thank you, Natasha. And the fall and winter, some of you might be applying with a fall course in 2023. All, all good. You go ahead and you're working on your course and you chime in with our community um, in terms of how it's going. Um, we can support you when courses start uh, both in the fall and the winter with student support resources. Some, sometimes we record videos like, yep, this is a kind of new way of looking at teaching and learning. Um, we are going to do, so we're going to research this. We're going to kind of see what you like and what you don't like. And as an instructor, we're going to see what, what works and what doesn't work. Um, so we just kind of like to be, when, uh, when folks are engaging in this prototyping process, what's put in front of students, we have to set them up for it. Um, and also provide you with just in time instructor support. So if something doesn't work technologically, you're trying something new, Patrick, and you'll have direct access to someone who can support you. Then as we get for later into the year in 2024, at the end of the funding cycle, process reflections, deli uh, delivery insights, obviously we'll have some dis distillations from the research um, of the courses that you're producing. And we'll discuss some next steps in terms of what, what worked and what didn't and how you might integrate these changes and this amazing experience <laughs> into the next time you run a course. Last one, Jean-Viev. Go for it, yeah. So these are some of the different sections of the applicant. One more, I think, Jean-Viev. Yeah, so these are some of the different sections of the application. And when you're doing your course description, like, I don't know if you can tell by the way that I talk, like I'm in academia, I, I you know, I work in academic innovation, but I, it's all about sales to a certain degree, right? Like why, not just the what, we don't just want to focus on the what, but why, what is the potential impact of this type of, I know Andrew's on the call, um, you know, Andrew has an amazing idea of working on changing assessment. Like why are we, you know, how can we promote mastery-based assessment at scale? And maybe VR is the way to do that. Sorry, I outed your idea, Andrew. <laughs> um, and the who, right? So you heard our previous applicants, uh, the success stories they were sharing, they knew exactly what the gaps were and what the needs were. So that's really important when you're designing, uh, when you're filling out your application. When you go to the redesign, make sure you give us both instructional uh, targets or goals, like curricularly, I want to try this, or pedagogically, I'm trying this, and maybe some technological side of things. Like I want to look at um, enhancing e-class, or I want to look at integrating a new piece of software, or so forth. Scalability is a big issue when it comes to course prototypes. At the institution, we want to look at changing the way we approach a course that has the ability to impact as many students as possible. So really do consider the disruptions of time and space and, and the applicability of the innovation that you're proposing to a wide, to maybe a first year large enrollment course. Even if that's not you, maybe there is some use and some value there that we could translate. And then of course, as Kartiga said, the SDGs, the social development goals, um, and the support network, yes. So you want to articulate in there like the faculty or department or program level support um, that you have in terms of sustaining this idea longer term. So I'll wait for questions. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a unique category. So SDG is the social de uh, social development goals. The UN SDG social development goals. Mary, yeah. Sustainable, sustainable development goals. Sustainable. Sorry. Thanks, Jovia. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, and now let's go to the third category, which is uh, to fund a scholarship of teaching and learning type of projects. And so here we really, um, this, this category is really aimed at uh, providing support for systematic approaches to documenting instructional effectiveness, uh, student learning. And so it aims to really answer the question, how do I know what I know, what I think I know and, uh, as an instructor? Uh, how do I know that I'm effective in the classroom? 
um, and, and looking at it from a, a lens of, of being uh, somewhat systematic by adopting um, a research approach to answering that question or these questions. So the kinds of projects that are eligible <clears throat> are pretty, it's pretty wide. It's any research project that aims to investigate an aspect of teaching and learning grounded in an, in an instructor's teaching. So generally speaking, the researcher is also the instructor for the course. And this comes with some um, opportunities and challenges when it comes to research ethics that uh, we um, in the teaching commons help you uh, walk through. Um, and there's also the uh, idea that as any research goes, at some point there is uh, a dissemination of the research outcomes in whichever way uh, makes sense for that faculty member and for that project. Uh, we like to say in, um, in ways that are appropriately public. So it might be public scholarship, it might be through informal means, or it might be through very formal means, including um, peer-reviewed uh, venues of different sorts. Um, <clears throat> the grant amount, just like category two, is $5,000 per project, and it comes with support from the teaching commons through a course that we um, lovingly call Educate. And uh, the, the goal of the course is to guide uh, the cohort um, to, to, towards um, a project that, that has a sound methodology that is grounded in theory and, and, and the literature, and that uh, has a, a solid study design for the question that it aims to answer. And as I said earlier, also that tackles um, the important ethical components of that a, such a study might uh, come to bear. So in a nutshell, that's what that is. And Andrew, um, so I'm gonna go, uh, uh, right to Andrew at this point, so that he can tell us a few words about uh, his project. Thanks. So, um, yeah, just very briefly, um, I was uh, interested in uh, taking over um, sort of the calculus for the life sciences course that's offered at York. And it's offered to the biology, psychology, and kinesiology students. Uh, course is huge, you know, roughly anywhere between 13 to 1500 students per semester. Uh, eight, you know, seven to eight sections. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of bodies and, you know, it's, um, the course has a, had, and probably still has a uh, fairly horrible reputation as something that's going to be a very bad experience for anybody who takes it. Um, so I've been working on fixing that and I wanted to take a bit of a systematic approach to that. So uh, I wanted to try like a couple flipped classroom style ideas, not, not totally or anything like that, but I wanted to see if that was going to have sort of a, the positive effect I wanted. Um, anyway, so, uh, I wanted to do a bit of a study. I put together the grant and I had a, so I'm, I'm very terrible at uh, writing grants and stuff like that as Michelle's going to be aware and is not already aware, but, um, so I, uh, I actually reached out for help from the teaching and learning center. So uh, I got put in touch with Mandy. Uh, Mandy's here. I think I see her. Yeah. Hi, Mandy. And, uh, yeah, and so Mandy took my very, very, very bad grant application and, and wrestled it into something that was actually decent. And then, so I blame, I blame Mandy entirely for my success uh, on this grant here. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, but then COVID sort of happened and sort of put a, a knife in my plans, at least in the way I wanted them. And so now I'm sort of just kind of recovering from going online and stuff like that and, and then coming back. And then so that study is still kind of ongoing a little bit in the sense of that project. But anyway, I was able to um, hire a couple of grad or a couple of, a couple of undergraduate students to um, to help me do create uh, materials creation and sort of quality checking and stuff like that. So you know, I was able to use the money to hire a couple of undergrads to assist me with uh, a lot of the legwork. And so you know, I find that, and I've heard from other people who do these kinds of grants that they find that part. I found it really satisfying to work with these two undergraduate students who um, they were really engaged and they said they learned a lot. So I thought that was like an extra nice side benefit that had nothing to do with the project. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I guess my story is basically, if you have an idea, talk to the people in teaching and learning and they can, you know, get you on the right path to, to the success that you need. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Andrew. Um, 
Okay, so Karthiga, I think earlier on, uh, put uh, some of these links in the chat. Uh, so for application guidelines and forms, um, we encourage you to, of course, uh, go to the AIF website and download the applicable uh, documents. Um, you will notice that assess the assessment criteria for all categories are included with the application um, uh, packages. And please read them closely because really the, the education um, committee uh, use, uses that rubric to, um, to assess every application. Um, so in terms of deadlines, uh, each faculty and school will have their own internal guidelines that you need to pay attention to. But the final uh, deadline by which a faculty or school needs to turn in all applications coming from their office is February 17, uh, 2023. Um, okay, so that uh, leaves us some time for questions and answers. We're happy to take your question either verbally or in the, uh, the chat. So I'm not sure that I'm gonna be able to see everybody uh, if a, a hand is raised. So I'll ask my colleagues to help figure so this out. I, yeah, if I can jump in, jean -Viet, there's a question about uh, for category 2B, but it applies for category 2A and 2B. If you're proposing a course, it has to be on group for governance approval, for sure, yes. Um, go through the regular governance approval process. And if it's not in the, um, lecture offering schedule, yes. Your, if you can include your anticipated timeline for approval, and we'll transfer the funding once we once you confirm that it has been gone through the approval process. I can take the question about experiential education. So, yeah. um, broadly speaking, experiential education can be classroom focused community focused or workplace focused, um, Mary. And so if it's in the class, if it's in the classroom, they refer to activities that have a real world component to them and um, through which students are not only engaged in some real world problem solving of some sort, but also reflecting on um, the significance of, of, of that issue. Uh, and kind of theorizing uh, based on, on the uh, hands-on experience that they have in the classroom. So that extends into the community. Uh, it's perhaps more intuitively, it makes uh, uh, even more intuitive sense, if you will. Uh, so if you think of placements, uh, of internships, uh, of work with community organizers and um, not, not for profit organizations where students are assigned um, to work with different folks and working on different projects, um, and then bringing that knowledge back into the classroom for further examination and theorizing. That would be um, what experiential education uh, is, broadly speaking. There was a question in the chat too, jean have about who to contact in uh, for different levels of support. And I believe you, we had some email addresses. Yeah, there, Here there you go. go. So um, if the questions are general about the uh, application process or some questions about the forms and things like that, your best bet is to contact the AVP Teaching and Learning uh, at yourq.ca. At any rate, if you reach out to the teaching commons with our generic email teaching at yourq.ca, no matter what your question is, we're going to triage it to the right person. Um, and so um, either or will do. Um, we in the teaching commons have drop-in office hours that are virtual from Monday through Friday, 10 to 11. That's for any uh, teaching related question uh, that you may have. Uh, and certainly you can use that time to connect with a real person in real time and ask your questions. Um, and again, uh, the, the team in the teaching commons is able to answer most questions and when not, uh, then we can back channel with uh, the appropriate uh, folks to make sure that your question gets answered. We're also planning a peer support session in January 
And we have a, uh, a survey that we're, we will be uh, putting in the chat as well as circulating after the session to know what kind of session would be most helpful to you should you be interested and available in January, say that over the holidays you mull over uh, um, some possibilities for, for projects that you would like to submit to AIF and then uh, come to the January session to brainstorm some more and get uh, get support uh, from some of us as well as your peers. Uh, the idea of the peer support session is also that we think that uh, AIF as a whole is stronger when there are uh, many strong applications and each application is uh, measured against the assessment criteria and against one another. So um, uh, if, if you have an opportunity to uh, brainstorm ideas with your colleagues from different departments that might spark different ideas, that might spark uh, collaborations. And so that's one way in which you can uh, get support from, from our uh, teaching and learning community. Okay. So there was a question about a budget. Um, I can answer that. So um, within category one, um, sorry, I have the guidelines open just a second. So non-eligible funding is um, capital construction, building renovations, furnishings, release time, and student financial aid. Um, category uh, two and three are $5,000 grants. So these are transferred to York Fund 400 research account, and you can expense funding within the funding guidelines there. So some examples could be purchasing uh, equipment, software, uh, providing a stipend for uh, hiring an RA or a work study student. So you can give a bursary, but you can hire a student to help with your project. Um, so those are some examples there. I can also take the question by Marlene. Um, you not knowing much about the context of your question, it sounds to me like what you're proposing might fall under category three, so uh, a solo type project uh, where you're examining something broader than a course uh, with uh, somewhat of a systematic lens to to really uh, measure the impact of something. Um, sounds like a category three to me. Uh, Manfred, in order to answer your question, I would need to know what e, uh, sorry, IDP stand for. It's the Individualized Development Plan, IDP, which is a part of FGS to foster professional development among grad students to continue being engaged with industry, with each other. And we found that social media is really the way to get through to them, including alum. And that requires constant upkeep because social media is here one second and gone the next. So you need to really dedicate resources, which we don't have. And it would be great to hire a grad student to be able to maintain and, and keep populating our social media sites. Okay, so... Um... It could be a category three, although if it's strictly to build something, uh, I would venture that it's probably more of a category two. If you want to research the, um, the impact of that professional development um, initiative, then potentially a category three. So uh, if it's possible, I just want to go up as well. There are some other ones that I think weren't, there were some other questions that I think weren't answered. Um, not to cut that short, Manfred, sorry. Um, if we have, uh, Arash was asking, if we have a new idea about course delivery with more student interaction to learn the course more easily, which category should I apply for? So um, it seems like category two to me, but it's, one of my colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong in terms of course development. So either in a community of practice model in 2B or 2A. Sorry, I'm not developing a course. It's a platform that everybody can develop their course with more interaction from the student to learn it easily. It's not a course. It's a delivery technique for all courses. Ah, okay. Jean-Bierre, would that be more cat one? Uh, probably. 
that yeah. would be category one. Yeah. And yeah. may I suggest if you're, what we noticed is if you're thinking of building like technology related tools, um, as Michelle and Javier mentioned, sustainability of these programs are key. Uh, there is a process for building enterprise-wide systems. So I would strongly encourage you to consult with your local IT units, uh, and then in turn, they can put you in touch with the relevant UIT unit that supports that initiative. Um, we, have, we have Michelle, Javier, and uh, the team work with a few colleagues. I'm not sure where your project would align, so I don't want to mention their name, so they're not bombarded with all these questions. But go through your IT person, make sure it's a faculty, like the, um, just a reminder, this is seed funding for three years. So let um, thinking about the sustainability uh, long term is really critical for success of um, category one projects, and that that means sustainability is having the decanal support. So um, I highly encourage you to consult with your IT team, and they can in touch in turn put you in touch with central units that could uh, help elevate your projects. Absolutely. And I hope Mary that answers your question a little bit in terms of differentiating Cat One and then Larkin. Um, yeah, a course redesign that's two. Well, it depends if you want to work in a community of practice model or not. That would be two. But yes, you are correct. So I just wanted to address those few questions that were way back up there. Um, Marlene, if the pro if the research can be done without funding, is there any point in applying for a grant? I mean. Um, Obviously, it's up to you, but for research dissemination, you might need uh, some funding for that. Um, and, and also, you might um, want to consider, to Andrew's point, how uh, an undergrad or graduate student, for that matter, might be able to augment what you're able to do um, in some way so that it becomes funding for them. So this is another reason to kind of think creatively about a particular project and where um, their insights and perspective might, might be helpful. And I think there was also a question about timing of funding. So I'll start with the easy ones, the category two and three, because these are $5,000 grants, they're transferred to fund 400 York internal research grant um, in May. So typically the announcements are made. So for 23, 24 projects, it would be May 2023. Uh, within category one, because these are large grants, initial 75% of the funding is transferred in May. And there's an interim uh, report that's due. So we do have periodic check-ins for category one and we have end of term check-ins for category two and three. So there are reporting requirements. So after the interim report for category one, the final 25% is transferred. Yes, Larry's question. So Kartiga did address some of Larry's questions where he was asking about the examples of how money could typically be spent. Um, but Larry's second question, Kartiga, was also regarding compensating people. What are the limitations on who could be paid by funding. Okay, so no faculty workload releases, and um, you can hire, hire contract faculty under the QP or postdoctor fellows, but you can hire USA staff according to the RHR process. You can hire uh, CPM contracts, uh, or you can secure a vendor. Um, but the procurement process is, as we know, in a public institution, is a nightmare. So, but you can hire graduate students under the RA. I'm not too familiar with graduate programs, but I encourage you to consult with FGS in terms of if you're thinking about a, hiring graduate students to support the work. Um, Larry, does that answer your question? Yeah. I don't believe there's a... Uh... A limit in the number of proposals uh, one faculty member submits. Is there, Kartiga? Uh, no, no. But uh, you can, up, there's no limit in how many proposals can be, you can apply, but um, within category one, uh, 
the most, I guess, I guess the most appealing, more successful proposal will be awarded uh, to, to faculty. Uh, again, in category one, because it's large scale initiatives, we do encourage collaboration. It could be colleagues from within the unit, outside of the unit. And if it's, uh, if it's um, uh, faculty wide initiatives or even program wide initiative, there are really great administrative teams like Mandy has shared her team's information there. So for example, if you're thinking about an EE project in LAMPS, you should consult with Melanie below or in LAPS. And those are really great administrative resources to collaborate with you and come on as partners for, for project. Um, that goes for uh, any central and faculty uh, wide uh, administrative units as well. Okay, well, we are at four o'clock. Um, we will make sure to download the, the chat um window so that uh, in case we missed any question we we can follow up after the session um and with that there is also the survey um that we would uh, encourage you to uh, complete so that we can go into the january uh, peer-based session with um, some understanding of what would be most helpful to those in attendance uh let me just stop sharing okay thank you everybody thank you guys